Welcome to Green and Red, Scrappy Politics for Scrappy People, a regular podcast on radical environmental and anti capitalist politics. Brought to you by Bob Bazanka and Scott Park. Hi, I'm Bob Bazenko, co-host of the Green and Red podcast, and I'm here to introduce a new feature, uh, Green and Red Archives. We've started putting our out encore episodes in an archives, uh, and this will include some older talks and events that Scott and I have organized or, or participated in over the years. Recently, to pay our respects to the great Daniel Ellsberg, uh, we put up a speech he gave in Houston in February of 2003 in which he spoke about many things, but in particular warned of the uh, coming war against Iraq in, in really prescient ways. And now we're going to stay on that theme and present to you a speech that took place in Houston a few months before that. In October of 2002, as the Bush administration was ramping up um, its efforts to invade Iraq, uh, I was honored to organize and introduce uh, Noam Chomsky to an overflow crowd at the University of Houston. Like Ellsberg, uh, Chomsky offered a succinct and historically driven argument against intervention in the Middle East and discussed the deceitful government and media narratives uh, driving what would become a bloody and, and consequential war. So enjoy this talk from Noam Chomsky and follow Green and Red on YouTube, on whichever podcast platform you prefer, on social media. And check out our webpage, which is at greenandredpodcast.org. And you can also find information there on contributing to our scrappy, uh, scrappy media efforts, if you wish. And so now here is Noam Chomsky talking about the U.S. and Iraq in October of 2002. Thank you. I was just telling one of my colleagues, Steve Mintz, that now I know what Colonel Tom Parker felt like. You know, kind of trying to run around here making sure everything went well. And now, standing up here, I kind of feel like I'm opening for Sinatra, so this is quite a night for me. Um, and on your way out, uh, if you see one of the ushers thank them, the, the students involved with the Houston Global Awareness Collective have done a, a fantastic job. And yeah, give, give it up for them. They've just been wonderful. And, and again, um, I want to thank Joe, the History Department, and Marty Melosi, who's not here tonight from the Tenneco Lecture Series, for their financial support. Uh, we really appreciate it. As I believe Athea said, we began, uh, I began pestering, actually, I wouldn't say requesting, pestering Noam to come here and around, uh, when I arrived in 95. And we finally booked this, I believe, in 1999. So three years of, ahead of time. I was talking to Bev uh, this past spring, uh, trying to, to work out the arrangements, and, and uh, Noam was about to leave uh, for Turkey where he was going to uh, show solidarity with a, a publisher who was uh, being tried, I believe, for sedition for publishing some of his works. And Noam was, uh, I'm sorry, Bev, his, his assistant, was obviously quite concerned that he was going to be in Turkey. And I shared that concern, too, but I wanted to say, but, but Bev, he can't be put in jail in Turkey because he has to be in Houston in October. <laughs> Luckily, I didn't say that, and, and, and his friend was acquitted. Um, it may seem like a powerful coincidence that we're in this place at this moment as the United States is preparing for an aggressive war in the Middle East. Unfortunately, the situation is actually marked by its ordinariness, not its uniqueness. For, for so long, as the United States has had global hegemony for the better part of the last century up to today, interventions abroad and regime changes and casual slaughters have been the foundation of America's role abroad. Iraq may be the target of the day, but the U.S. is acting as if this were Haiti or, or Guatemala or Iran or Nicaragua or Cuba or Korea or Vietnam or Libya, and the list is endless. You could go on endlessly. Anywhere the U.S. has power and interest, it is apt to intervene. At the turn of the century, an American Secretary of State, Richard Olney, described U.S. policy quite candidly. He said, today the United States is practically sovereign on this continent and its fiat is law upon the subjects to which it confines its interposition. 
Today, the only thing we would change about all these dictum is that America's reach is global, not merely continental. Today, even more than ever, the powerful yet ironic words of General and President Dwight Eisenhower ring true when he said, this conjunction of an immense military establishment and a large arms industry is new in the American experience. The total influence, economic, political, even spiritual, is felt in every city, every state house, every office of the federal government. We recognize the imperative need for this development, yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. Our toil, resources, and livelihood are all involved. So is the very structure of our society. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by this military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or our democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and a knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial machi military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals so that security and liberty may prosper together. Eisenhower later said, every gun that is fired, every warship launched, every rocket fired, signifies in the final sense a theft from those who are hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed. Today, as we look into this world of aggression and power, it's easy to feel despair, it's easy to give up. The councils of government, the men of power, have little accountability. They do what they want and they tend to get away with it. They understand, as Thucydides said in the Malian Dialogues, as Athenian envoys were talking to representatives of a tiny island named Milos they were about to take over, that the strong do as they will and the weak submit as they must. But even in this despair, people speak out. They have to speak out. During the Vietnam War, Martin Luther King spoke out. He called the U.S. society a country gone mad on war. And he called America the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today. But then he called on people. He demanded that people act. He said, a time comes when silence is betrayal. That time has come for us in relation to Vietnam. The truth of these words is beyond doubt. But the mission to which they call us is a most difficult one even when pressed by the demands of inner truth. Men do not easily assume the task of opposing their government's policy, especially in time of war. Nor does the human spirit move without great difficulty against all the apathy of conformist thought within one's own bosom and in the surrounding world. Moreover, when the issues at hand seem as perplexed as they often do, in the case of this dreadful conflict, we are always on the verge of being mesmerized by uncertainty, but we must move on. We are at the moment when our lives must be placed on the line if our nation is to survive its own folly. Every man of humane convictions must decide on the protest that best suits his or her man or woman, must of humane convictions, I'm kind of updating uh, uh, King for gender correctness, uh, must decide on the protest that best suits his or her own convictions, but we must all protest. And so today we must all protest. We must leave this building tonight, not simply satisfied that we heard a powerful voice for action, but committed to move beyond passive participation, committed to protesting in any ways that we can. Conformity, fear, and alienation are powerful forces which keep us estranged too often from our own mission to do what's right, and we all know what's right. To speak out when peace and justice are threatened, it's much easier to be silent, to go along, than to act. The risks are great and the rewards are often not tangible. But deep inside, in one's core, at that moment of truth, we know what's right and what's wrong. And we have to say it loud and with conviction, and then others will see from that example and have to stand up and shout as well. Tonight's guest is well known all over the world for having his voice heard. He is, as the New York Times said, and he's embarrassed from hearing so many times, the most important intellectual alive. In that vein, uh, indulge me, I'd like to read a brief poem which speaks to a, a lot of these issues and, and reminded me of Noam Chomsky the first time I read it. It's written by a Guatemalan named Otto René Castillo, and it's called Apolitical Intellectuals. One day, the apolitical intellectuals of my country will be interrogated by the simplest of our people. They will be asked what they did when their nation died out slowly, like a sweet fire, small and alone. No one will ask them about their dress, their long siestas after lunch. No one will want to know about their sterile combats with the idea of the nothing. No one will care about their higher financial learning. They won't be questioned on Greek mythology or regarding their self-disgust when someone within them begins to die the coward's death. 
They'll be asked nothing about their absurd justifications, born in the shadow of the total lie. On that day, the simple men will come. Those who had no place in the books and poems of the apolitical intellectuals, but daily delivered their bread and milk, their tortillas and eggs, those who mended their clothes, those who drove their cars, who cared for their dogs and gardens and worked for them. And they'll ask, what did you do when the poor suffered, when tenderness and life burned out in them? Apolitical intellectuals of my sweet country, you will not be able to answer. A vulture of silence will eat your gut, your own misery will pick at your soul, and you will be mute in your shame. Noam Chomsky's obviously never been an apolitical intellectual. He's been in the fray his entire life, speaking out for peace and justice all over the globe, and he's been an inspiration to legions of other intellectuals, activists, and others for generations. I was first introduced to him a long time ago. I was in a used bookstore with a friend who handed me a, a fray copy of a book called American Power and the New Mandarins, and I began leafing through it later and saw an essay titled The Responsibility of Intellectuals, and it more or less blew my mind, and that's why I'm here tonight. I grew up in a liberal home, and, and I believe that the media and professors and, and people like that were concerned with common folk, that there was a, a fundamental decency in our political system, that, you know, Lyndon Johnson and Hubert Humphrey would take care of everything, uh, that a great society would soon exist. Um, but reading uh, The Responsibility of Intellectuals just made me rethink all those uh, uh, predispositions. Uh, in it, Noam said, uh, intellectuals are in a position to expose the lies of government, to analyze actions according to their causes and motives and often hidden intentions. It's the responsibility of intellectuals to speak the truth and to expose the lies. And then he concluded, the question, what have I done, is one that we may well ask ourselves as we read each day of fresh atrocities in Vietnam, as we create or mouth or tolerate the deceptions that will be used to justify the next defense of freedom. And we can say today, the question, what have I done, is one that we may well ask ourselves as we read each day of fresh atrocities in Iraq, in Palestine, fill in the blank, as we create or mouth or tolerate the deceptions that will be used to justify the next defense of freedom. Today, intellectuals in the media, in the universities, in schools and elsewhere are covering up about Israel, about Turkey, about Colombia, about Venezuela, and so many other places. And it is our job to break through that haze, to seek that truth amid the power, to raise our voices and our bodies against it. And so to work toward that end, I am very humbled to introduce Noam Chomsky. you can hear me better than I can see you, which is about zero, but I'll assume there's some people out there. And uh, if my voice fades, as it tends to do from too much talking, uh, make a ruckus and I'll speak up. Uh, it's uh, generally assumed that uh, the events of September 11th uh, changed the world dramatically that nothing will ever be the same uh, as we move into a new era of human history, the, an age of terror, uh, as it was called. That's the title of a, the first book of academic essays that came out shortly after September 11th, Yale University professors mostly. Uh, they regarded the uh, anthrax attacks, which they attributed to bin Laden uh, as even uh, more ominous than what had happened at September 11th. Uh, and uh, it's clear that the world has changed. So take, say, Iraq, what's on everybody's mind. Uh, since September 11th, Iraq has become a threat to our very existence. Uh, so according to National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice, uh, the next bit of evidence we're likely to discover about uh, Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction will be a mushroom cloud. 
she didn't say where, but presumably that means in New York or Washington. Uh, the neighboring countries don't seem to perceive the threat. Uh, actually, they're worried, all right, but they're worried about the United States and its attack on Iraq, and not about Saddam Hussein. Uh, interestingly, that's true even of Kuwait and Iran, two countries that were invaded by Saddam Hussein uh, when he was a U.S. ally. Uh, the countries of the region uh, are trying to reestablish relations with Iraq and reintegrate it into their system. Uh, so presumably they don't expect a mushroom cloud. Uh, well, that's since September 11th. Uh, before September 11th, we weren't facing that threat of destruction from Iraq. So surely September 11th changed something, brought about a major change undoubtedly. Well, uh, if we want to understand the world, uh, not just follow marching orders, we're going to ask uh, what the change was. Was it a change in an objective threat? Uh, was it a change even in a, in a perceived threat? Or was it a change in opportunity? That is, an opportunity to pursue goals that are, in fact, uh, longstanding. Now, that's a pretty serious question. It should be the central topic of discussion and commentary, at least for those who want to understand the world, to get some picture of where it's going, and uh, not simply to join a cheering section. Uh, and that's the question, the background question that I'm going to have in mind in these remarks. Uh, and many s sort of side questions immediately come up. I mean, for example, the claim is that uh, the problem with Iraq is that we, the, what we have to do is get rid of Saddam Hussein, uh, regime change, uh, eliminate the possibilities of um, any capabilities of developing weapons of mass destruction, uh, maybe on the side, uh, gain access to Iraq's oil. Well, if those are the goals, there are some simple ideas that come to mind about how to achieve them. Uh, they're not ever discussed. Uh, one might ask why they're never discussed. I could go on with that, uh, maybe later if you're interested. But uh, I'd, I'll keep to some more general, broader, <coughs> broader uh, background issues about <coughs> world order and about how we might proceed to understand it. Well, there's surely some truth to the idea that September 11th changed the world. Uh, the target on September 11th was not uh, Cuba or Nicaragua or Lebanon or Chechnya or any of the other uh, traditional victims of large-scale international terrorism. Uh, rather, the target in this case was a state with awesome power to shape the future. Uh, in fact, power with absolutely no historical precedent. So it follows at once uh, that if we want to gain a realistic picture of the likely future, uh, we're going to investigate the U.S. government, its policies, its past policies, its present policies, and the roots of those policies in the institutions of the country. Uh, that's just elementary sanity. And that would be true no matter who happened to be in office. Uh, it's dramatically true when power is in the hands of people we know all about, uh, people who have an ample record of exercising power. Uh, most of those with their hands on the levers of power are uh, recycled Reaganites, and they have a record uh, that we know a lot about. Uh, those are facts that ought to be in the forefront of our attention, uh, particularly because their record runs right through the 1990s as well, and not just in the United States. Uh, so say, take uh, Richard Pearl. Uh, people in the Washington Press Corps have told me that journalists there refer to him as Darth Vader. I can't vouch for that, uh, but could be true. Uh, he's uh, an influential planner now, as he was during the Reagan years. Uh, and a few years ago, five years ago, he was writing position papers for uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, 
uh, in Israel, uh, who is well to the right of Ariel Sharon in the Israeli spectrum. Uh, and those connections are very close, the ultra-right in Israel and the power brokers here, as the Israeli press is commonly discussing. Uh, and the position papers that he and Doug Feith were writing, uh, they have earlier roots, uh, and they have a good deal of resonance in, in current uh, geopolitical uh, planning, geostrategic planning, going back to the 80s, in fact. Uh, again, as the Israeli press, which is usually pretty well informed, has been pointing out. Well, those are things we ought to be thinking about. Uh, there are some other facts that should be prominent in our minds as well. Uh, one is that it has been recognized for some years, uh, long before September 11th, that um, with new technologies, the rich and powerful states are going to lose their uh, monopoly, virtual monopoly, of the means of violence. Uh, they'll retain an overwhelming preponderance, as they do, but it won't be a monopoly. So a couple of years before September 11th, uh, just to quote one of many technical papers, it points out that a well-planned, I'm quoting, a well-planned operation to sw uh, smuggle weapons of mass destruction into the United States would have a 90% probability of success, uh, far greater than a missile attack uh, with or without uh, national missile defense, even if it worked. Uh, that's uh, what's been called America's Achilles heel, uh, the title of a major book uh, published a couple of years before September 11th by uh, a number of uh, well-known strategic analysts and technical experts. If you read the book, you'll find it's virtually a guidebook for terrorists, various things they could do. Uh, all of this has been evident, and in fact, it's been evident to everyone with their eyes open, at least since 1993. Remember that in 1993, uh, groups related to Al-Qaeda uh, tried to blow up the World Trade Center and came very close. Uh, estimates are that with better planning, they could have carried it off and killed tens of thousands of people, and their ambitions were much broader. They also targeted the FBI building, the UN buildings, uh, tunnels under the Hudson River, they were caught before they could do it, uh, but they were on their way. And as I said, with better planning, might have succeeded. Well, the political leadership certainly knows that. Uh, U.S. intelligence certainly knew it as well. So did strategic analysts, and in fact, careful readers of the press uh, were well aware of it uh, also. Uh, the fact that a similar attempt was successful on September 11th does not really seriously affect the threat assessments. Uh, they were there before, and they remain, and the reasons for them are understood pretty well. Uh, there has been some success since September 11th in uh, dismantling networks of the Al-Qaeda variety. By far the greatest success has been in Europe, uh, primarily in Germany, uh, through careful police work, which had some real successes. Uh, the bombing of Afghanistan, at least according to U.S. intelligence, had uh, almost no effect. Uh, that was just uh, reiterated in uh, this morning's newspapers reporting the uh, um, analysis by the George Tenet, CIA head to Congress yesterday, who, um, according to the reports, says that the threats today are about the same as they were before September 11th, so whatever has been done hasn't changed that. Uh, there is a footnote to all of this. Uh, as the CIA pointed out a couple of weeks ago, just repeating the obvious, you don't need an intelligence agency to tell you this, uh, the threats would increase, uh, maybe significantly, uh, if the U.S. were to attack Iraq. And that's for pretty obvious reasons. Put yourself into Saddam Hussein's shoes and you can figure it all out. Uh, the uh, worst case analysis, which is by no means unimaginable, is that uh, what are called loose nukes might find their way into hands of uh, fanatics bent on revenge, and uh, remember the uh, 
90% probability of success. So there surely are ways of increasing the threats. Uh, and there are some folks not too far from here who are pursuing plans uh, that uh, are very likely to have exactly that consequence, as they perfectly well know. Uh, well, on September 11th, the threats were realized uh, with uh, wickedness and awesome cruelty, to bother, borrow the world words of the most distinguished member of the Middle East International Press Corps, Robert Fisk, uh, right away capturing the world reaction of shock and horror and sympathy for the uh, innocent victims. Uh, and it was a major event, not only because of the scale. It's the first time in modern history, um, ever maybe, that uh, the rich and powerful countries, the Western countries, have uh, suffered on home soil uh, atrocities of the kind that are unfortunately all too familiar elsewhere. Uh, the history uh, should be familiar enough so that there's no need to review it. Uh, the West may, may prefer to forget it. Uh, the victims surely don't. Uh, that's a sharp break in the traditional pattern and uh, that means that it was a historic event of great importance. The repercussions are sure to be significant. Well, the, what those will be, what the consequences will be, uh, that'll be determined substantially by policy choices in the United States. So we're back to the obvious. Uh, if we want to understand anything, uh, we will therefore begin with an investigation of US power, uh, how it's exercised, particularly in the very recent past up till now, how it's interpreted within the political culture. That's assuming minimal rationality. Actually, it's a minority opinion. It's considered so extreme that it uh, scarcely appears within mainstream discussion, as you can determine for yourselves. And if it's even uh, mentioned it, or noticed, uh, it elicits uh, near hysteria, which is, we can learn something from that. It's also uh, illuminating uh, to see how the record uh, of the very recent past, how frequently it's even uh, mentioned, uh, let alone investigated in any serious way, in the reams of commentary on the so-called war on terror that was redeclared on September 11th. Uh, let me stress, redeclared. It requires really impressive subordination to state violence uh, not to notice that the war was actually declared 20 years earlier uh, as the Reagan administration came to office with very much the same rhetoric and many of the same people in leading positions. Well, surely uh, the record of the first phase of the so-called war on terror is relevant, highly relevant, to understanding the redeclared war, uh, at least if understanding is preferred to blind faith. Uh, and that's particularly true because the shocking record of uh, US-backed international terrorism during those years continued in the years that followed up to the present. But all that's buried deep in the memory hole, uh, not, however, among the victims. Uh, it's also instructive to uh, study the various devices that are used within the political and intellectual culture uh, to overcome the threat of understanding. Uh, the simplest one is just uh, deceit and evasion. Uh, too many examples even to bother mentioning. Uh, a slightly uh, less dishonest approach is the uh, appeal to a kind of miraculous conversion. So according to this idea, uh, yes, there were flaws in the past, uh, but now they're overcome, so we can forget all that uh, boring and irrelevant stuff about facts and other nonsense like that uh, up to, say, two minutes ago, and we can march on to a righteous future. Uh, that's a very useful doctrine, kind of doctrine of change of course, wipe out history. 
Uh, it's invoked every few years. In fact, I've reviewed a lot of cases in print, but all that's irrelevant because this time it's different. Uh, how do we know it's different? Well, it's different because we say it's different, so therefore it's different. It's instructive to review examples, including some very recent ones. I'll again skip that for lack of time. You can return if you like. Uh, there is a scholarly variant of this, which is more serious. Uh, that does recognize that the historical record is pretty ugly, but the uh, thesis is that we can dismiss all of that as what's called the abuse of reality, which is to be distinguished from reality itself. I'm quoting now. Reality itself is the unachieved national purpose, uh, which is transcendent. When you get big words like transcendent, you know, you're in academic scholarship. Uh, the uh, national, the transcendent national purpose is the establishment of equality and freedom. And if there's a departure from it, that's just abuse of reality. Actually, I'm quoting the founder of what's called realist uh, international relations theory. And I want to stress that I'm not quoting it in criticism. He happens to have been a fine scholar and an unusually decent person, if you like him, in the professional fields. Uh, well, that happened to be 40 years ago. Uh, there's a current version of this, uh, produced right around September 11th by a prominent and respected scholar in a leading prestigious journal. Uh, he writes that there's a guiding principle that defines the parameters within which the policy debate occurs. Uh, and this guiding principle is so authoritative as to be virtually immune from challenge, uh, apart from tattered remnants of the right and the left. Uh, the principle is that history has a discernible direction and destination, and uniquely among the nations of the world, the United States comprehends and manifests history's purpose. Okay, follows then that US hegemony is the realization of history's purpose, and it's necessarily for the common good, and furthermore, this is a truism, uh, so that facts are irrelevant. We should simply stand there and worship at the shrine. Uh, there's a kind of a vulgar version of this that you read day after day from the president and commentators and so on. And this, is a, this doctrine is not an innovation. It has a rather uh, distinguished pedigree, in fact. It goes back a long time. So for example, a century before uh, Rumsfeld and Cheney, uh, Woodrow Wilson called for the conquest of the Philippines because, as he put it, our interest must march forward, altruists though we are. Uh, other <laughs> Other nations must see to it that they stand off and do not seek to stay us. Sounds familiar. Uh, as we proceed to liberate the Philippines, uh, also liberating um, several hundred thousand souls from life's torments. Uh, there were some critics, uh, some obscure folk like Mark Twain, for example, and since, fortunately, uh, we live in a free society, uh, his criticisms, very bitter anti-imperialist uh, essays, uh, these are readily available. It's true uh, 90 years later, uh, but you can't have everything. Uh, and when they appeared, uh, without a comment, at least that I could find, apart from the usual scoundrels. Uh, and uh, Wilson was just drawing from the highest peaks of European enlightenment in this regard, as anyone who's paid attention to the history knows very well. Well, all of that's one choice. Uh, the other choice is to understand reality to be reality uh, and to uh, ask whether the uh, uh, unpleasant record of uh, reality uh, consists of uh, uh, flaws in the pursuit of history's purpose, or whether it has more mundane causes, as in the case of every other uh, power system, past and present. Uh, 
Uh, that's a position that's known as anti-Americanism or hating, hating America in the technical literature. Well, if we adopt that stance, saying U.S. is just like everyone else, uh, and we join the tattered remnants uh, that don't fall within the authoritative spectrum, I think we would be led to conclude, with regard to the main topic tonight, that policy choices are likely to remain pretty stable uh, within a framework that's pretty well entrenched, uh, enhanced, no doubt, perhaps in important ways, but fundamentally unchanged. Uh, and there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, one is the stability of the basic institutions, power decisions do flow from them, uh, but there are also uh, narrower reasons uh, which uh, merit a good deal of attention, I think. Uh, one of them I've already mentioned, the fact that the war on terror on September 11th was redeclared uh, with the same rhetoric as 20 years before and most of the same people in charge. Uh, remember that the Reagan administration came into office in 1981 uh, announcing that a main focus of U.S. policy will be terrorism, particularly state-sponsored international terrorism. It's a plague spread, uh, spread by depraved opponents of civilization itself in a return to barbarism in the modern age. Actually, I'm quoting the administration moderate, uh, George Schultz, who was the Colin, Colin Powell of his day. Uh, well, the war on terrorism that was uh, announced in 1981, uh, that was going to focus on two areas where the plague was raging with uh, unusual virulence. Uh, that was Central America and the Middle East. Uh, the greatest threat to civilization was Central America. Uh, there, there was a cancer right here in our landmass, which was planning to conquer the hemisphere and destroy the United States, uh, openly announcing the goals of Mein Kampf. Uh, that's all George Schultz again. Well, luckily for us, uh, the White House was occupied by a brave cowboy uh, who stopped it. He uh, declared a national emergency because, I'll quote his words, because the policies and the actions of the government of Nicaragua constitute an unusual and extraordinary threat to the national security and foreign policy of the United States. Uh, he even uh, had to bomb Libya for that reason. Libya was bringing the war home to the United States, he said, by providing arms to these uh, monsters who were just on the verge of conquering the hemisphere. Uh, and that was part of uh, the mad dog Gaddafi's uh, uh, effort to uh, expel America from the world. The, cowboy told us. Uh, so if you think there's a threat today, uh, just remember uh, what a narrow escape we had uh, just a few years ago uh, when it was really close. And it's not that people weren't frightened. It's very easy to frighten people. Uh, every leader, a dictator, Democrat, everyone else knows that. It's the last resort of real scoundrels and very effective. Well, that was one locus of the threat, the cancer right here in our hemisphere. The second locus, uh, hardly less dreadful, was the Middle East Mediterranean region. If you run through the record of the 1980s, the Reagan years, uh, that was uh, constantly one of the top stories of the year. Uh, in, the, in the year 1985, it was in fact picked as the top story of the year in the annual poll, Associated Press poll of editors and it ranked very high in other years. This also happens to be the primary focus of the redeclared war on terror. So again, rationality tells us that a closer look um, is very important, at least if we want to understand what's happening now uh, and what lies ahead. Well, let's just take the peak year uh, 1985. Uh, what were the top terrorist acts of the region in that year? Well, there are actually three contenders. Uh, one of them was a car bombing in Beirut. Uh, a truck car bomb bomb was placed out, was outside a mosque, uh, timed to go off when people were leaving the mosque, and it did. 
It killed 80 people, mostly women and girls. Uh, it was a very powerful bomb, ripped up houses all the way down the street, killed infants in their bed, beds, uh, wounded a couple hundred people. Uh, however, that uh, doesn't count. That's not part of the canon of terrorism. Uh, the reason is it was traced back to the CIA and British intelligence, so it's kind of off the record. Uh, the second uh, contender for chief terrorist act in the region was uh, the Israeli bombing of Tunis with no credible pretext. They barely tried, killed 75 people, uh, also 85, expedited by the United States praised by the United States right after the bombing and the killings. Uh, George Shultz called his Israeli counterpart to congratulate him and express U.S. support for this wonderful act. Uh, the, the U.S. sort of backed off and began to keep quiet about it when the Security Council met and uh, condemned it unanimously, U.S. abstaining uh, as an act of armed aggression. I actually notice that's worse than international terrorism. That means uh, Nuremberg trials. But let's give the benefit of the doubt to the United States and its client and call it only international terrorism. Uh, the third contender for the prize uh, was the uh, so-called, what, what the Israeli government called its iron fist operations uh, in southern Lebanon. Uh, occupied southern Lebanon. This is under the dovish labor government, uh, Shimon Peres. Uh, the targets of the operations were what the high command called terrorist vi villagers, terrorist villagers. Uh, the atrocities reached uh, new depths of calculated brutality and arbitrary murder in the words of a Western diplomat in the area, amply supported by uh, press coverage, uh, mostly abroad, but some even here, plenty in Israel. Uh, um, murder, uh, atrocities, kidnapping, taking people back to prison in Israel, in Israel and so on. Uh, that's the third act. Nobody knows the numbers, probably hundreds. Uh, well, those, those are the three peak examples of international terrorism, or maybe worse, uh, in the peak year of 1985. However, if you look at the scholarly literature, um, certainly media, they don't count. They don't enter the canon. Uh, two incidents do enter the canon, exactly two. Uh, in each of them, one person was killed, uh, in each case an American, uh, and those are not forgotten. Well, that tells you something about what terrorism is. It has nothing to do with terrorism. It has to do with whether they do it to us or we do it to them, and that's important to understand when you want to know something about the war on terror. Uh, the, uh, Worst, and that's not a U.S. innovation, incidentally. As far as I know, that practice is universal, uh, even among the worst mass murderers. So say, take the Nazis. Uh, they didn't say that they were carrying out terror in occupied Europe. They were carrying out what they called counter-terror. Uh, they were protecting the population against the terrorism of the uh, uh, partisans who were terrorists uh, directed from abroad. And like all propaganda, there's, you can imagine there's an element of truth to that. The partisans did resort to terror. They surely were directed from abroad. Nobody tried to deny that. Uh, and you know, governments like Vichy had about as much legitimacy as uh, kinds of governments the US and its allies set up throughout much of the world. Uh, and in fact, if there's an exception to this practice, I have yet to find it. So the U.S. was breaking, is breaking no ground on that. It's not a nice precedent, but it's uh, not an innovation. Well, the worst atrocity, uh, terrorist atrocity, if not aggression, of that uh, period, the uh, 1980s in the Middle East region, was the uh, U.S.-backed Israeli invasion of Lebanon in 1982, which killed about 20,000 people. There wasn't even a pretext of self-defense, uh, the, the uh, operation was taken as was openly uh, uh, proclaimed in Israel in order to undermine efforts uh, to reach a political settlement of the occupied territories that uh, the United States and Israel didn't want. Well, that's a textbook example of international terrorism. Uh, 
again, if not aggression, in which case we call for Nuremberg trials. Uh, without going on, uh, in both of those two regions, both of the two regions were the, which were the focus of the war on terror, the terrorist commanders in Washington, uh, who are now once again in charge, uh, they did compile a record of atrocities that vastly exceeded anything that could be attributed to their targets. Uh, in Central America, ended up with hundreds of thousands of people killed, uh, four countries devastated, uh, judgment of the world court, uh, ordering the United States, States to cease its uh, unlawful use of force, which is international terrorism. Uh, that was backed by the Security Council, or would have been, except that the U.S. vetoed a resolution uh, supporting the world court judgment and calling on all states to observe international law, considered so insignificant it was barely even reported here. Uh, the U.S. responded by escalating the terrorist war. That was the response to the order to terminate it, uh, with including the first official orders to attack uh, what the high command called soft targets, meaning undefended civilian targets. Uh, with the approval of liberal opinion, incidentally. Uh, the prime target throughout, one prime target was the church, uh, which the U.S. was fighting with Catholic Church, uh, which the U.S. was attacking with uh, as much uh, passion and intensity as it now directs to radical Islam. The church had committed a grave sin. The Latin American church had uh, turned towards what was called the preferential option for the poor, Priests and nuns and others were working to organize poor peasants, help them take control over their lives. Uh, that's a sin. That's a crime. Can't be tolerated. Uh, the uh, School of the Americas, famous School of the Americas, uh, now, now proclaims that uh, uh, one of its, what's called its talking points, that explains why it's a great place, uh, that the U.S. Army helped defeat liberation theology. Uh, which is quite true. Uh, it's symbolic that uh, that hideous decade in Central America uh, began with the assassination of an archbishop who had become a voice for the voiceless, ended with the assassination of six leading Jesuit intellectuals, and of, of course, tens of thousands of the usual victims, and uh, they're all unknown. Uh, you can do an experiment and ask your educated friends, how many people have read anything written by the six leading Jesuit intellectuals who had their brains blown out by uh, elite forces armed and trained by the United States, uh, who, who can even remember their names. If they had been Czech intellectuals who had suffered anything like that under the Russians, you'd know about it, but not in this case. It's an important principle that you should never know anything about your own crimes. Uh, and their educational system and intellectual culture are carefully designed to uh, ensure that outcome. You can test it in this rather striking case. Uh, that's not the only example of uh, uh, Washington-based international terrorism in the 1980s. Uh, another example is very uh, much prominent right now, Iraq. Uh, through the 1980s, uh, Saddam Hussein did carry out uh, horrendous atrocities. You can read uh, Condoleezza Rice this morning explaining that we can't let this terrible man survive. Uh, he used uh, chemical warfare uh, in his war against Iran. Uh, he even used chemical warfare against his own people. Uh, incidentally, they were his own people in the sense that the Cherokees were Andrew Jackson's own people, but uh, we can forget that. That's, uh, and uh, Rice, and Rice is absolutely correct. He carried all, all those atrocities, by far his worst crimes. Uh, she didn't mention, following the convention, uh, that all of this was done with our help. I can't say that part. Uh, and it continued. Uh, the help uh, had uh, nothing to do with the Cold War. Clearly, Russia was also helping. It didn't have anything to do with the Iran-Iraq War either. We continued to give them the same assistance well after the worst atrocities that are now charged were well known uh, after the Iran-Iraq War was over. Uh, and the reasons were 
quite frankly stated. So the White House explained that uh, providing Saddam Hussein with uh, dual-use technology that uh, enables him to develop weapons of mass destruction, which was in fact what was happening, uh, those give great trade opportunities for U.S. companies uh, and contribute to the stability of the region by supporting a moderate state. Uh, that went on right up to virtually the day of uh, the invasion of Kuwait. Uh, last uh, couple of weeks before the invasion, George Bush number one uh, proved the sale of advanced data transmission equipment to his friendly SOB, as he was called. Uh, in the uh, preceding couple of weeks, licenses had been approved for about $5 million worth of advanced technology products. Uh, that included computers for the Ministry of Industry and Military Industrialization and a research center that shortly after was destroyed by bombing on the grounds that it was developing rockets and poison gas and another plant that was repeatedly bombed as a chemical weapons factory and that's only a small piece of it. Uh, that went on, in fact, in the spring of 1990, uh, George Bush, number one, who I guess is hiding out in Texas somewhere, uh, he uh, uh, sent a Senate high-level senatorial delegation to visit his friend. This is the spring of 1990, couple, right before the invasion of Kuwait. It was headed by Bob Dole, later Republican presidential candidate. They brought George Bush's greetings, uh, informed Saddam, Saddam that uh, he shouldn't be bothered too much by the uh, criticism he's getting from the press here. We've got this free press thing, which is pretty hard to control, and sometimes reporters uh, go off in weird directions. Uh, one of the senators uh, even suggested to Saddam that he invite the press to come to Iraq so they could see for themselves and stop this criticism. So yes, all of these hideous crimes took place uh, with our aid and support, and the British as well. In fact, the British were a little slow on the draw and they continued to provide Saddam with uh, technology usable for weapons of mass destruction even a couple of days after the invasion of Kuwait. It took a little time to cut it off. Uh, so yes, there were further atrocities in the 1980s uh, during the so-called War on Terror. Uh, well, that doesn't exhaust the record by any means. Things are happening elsewhere in the world too. So for example, take Africa. Uh, Washington's uh, South African ally during the Reagan years alone was responsible for killing about a million and a half people, over $60 million of damage in the neighboring countries, forgetting South Africa. Uh, meanwhile, Reagan was evading congressional sanctions and in fact even increased trade in the late 80s. Uh, UNICEF uh, estimated that about 850,000 infants and young children were killed during those years, uh, 150,000 of them in the neighboring countries, this is under South African attack, uh, 150,000 of them in 1998, uh, 1988, sorry. That's the year when Washington announced officially uh, that uh, uh, condemned officially what they called one of the more notorious terrorist groups in the world that's Nelson Mandela's African National Congress. That's the end of the Reagan years, 1988. Well, that's just a brief glance at the first phase of the war on terror. It was a real age of terror, uh, far beyond anything suffered by the rich and powerful then or now, but all out of history. You can check for yourselves, and in fact, you know without checking that none of this is considered relevant to the redeclared war on terror. Uh, the base of U.S. terrorist operations in uh, Central America was Honduras. Uh, the ambassador to Honduras in the first part of the Reagan years was John Negroponte, who's now in charge of the diplomatic component of the new redeclared war on terror at the United Nations. Uh, the special, Reagan special envoy to the Middle East was Donald Rumsfeld, who's now Secretary of Defense. The National Security Advisor uh, in the final years of um, the so-called war on terrorism is Colin Powell. Uh, other leading figures then have now reappeared and hold 
prominent and important positions. Uh, have they changed in some way? Um, if so, uh, what's the evidence? Uh, has anybody asked whether they've changed? No. Of course, what they did then is considered apparently perfectly okay, maybe praiseworthy, and therefore irrelevant to uh, the redeclared war with the same people and the same rhetoric. Uh, furthermore, that continues right through the 1990s. Uh, Clinton just took it over and extended it. It's enough to have a look at the uh, leading uh, recipients of US military aid and take a look at what they were up to. Uh, the leading recipients were, in, those, in the Clinton years, Turkey and Colombia, uh, both of which have hideous uh, human rights records. I just won't go into it, but just as a personal aside, the last couple of months I happened to have visited uh, the scenes of some of the worst, most grisly terrorist atrocities of the 1990s, terrible decade, in southeastern Turkey and later in southern Colombia, uh, where they're still continuing including U.S. chemical warfare, which is having a devastating effect. Uh, that's putting aside uh, uh, Israel and Egypt. They are a separate category, one that's not pleasant to review and quite uh, pertinent to the uh, question of international terrorism and the prospects for the future. Well, without going into that, let me just repeat the obvious. We've got two choices. One is history is bunk, as Henry Ford said. We can march forward with confidence that the global enforcer will drive evil from the world, uh, just as his speechwriters declare, uh, plagiarizing uh, ancient epics and uh, children's fairy tales. Uh, that's one choice. Uh, the other choice is that we can look at the record and the doctrines of the proclaimed new era, subject them to scrutiny, and maybe get some sense of the emerging reality. If there's a third way, I don't see it. Uh, let me just, you know, of the innumerable examples that one can give to illustrate, I mean, you can list a lot of them superficially, but let's take one major one and just look at it a little more carefully, see what we can learn from it is very pertinent today and to the war on terror. So right at this moment, right now, uh, everyone's eyes are or should be focused on the Cuban Missile Crisis 40 years ago. And it's right to do so. That was uh, the most dangerous moment in human history. Uh, Arthur Schlesinger just observed correctly, historian and Kennedy advisor. Uh, the world was literally minutes away from destruction. We've just learned some startling facts about it just in the last few weeks. Uh, we learned that the Northern Hemisphere survived uh, because of one Russian submarine captain, Vasily Archipov, uh, who convinced his fellow officers not to fire nuclear missiles at a, one of the tensest moments of the missile crisis when they were attacked by U.S. destroyers off Cuba. Uh, if, they had, if he hadn't countermanded that order, uh, it would have led to a nuclear exchange and that would have effectively have been the end. Uh, that's how close it was. Uh, that's kind of relevant to uh, uh, what's happening right now, not only the war on Iraq that the administration is determined to wage and will unless it can be stopped from within, uh, but also the so-called war on terror particularly because of the role of Cuba in the war on terror. Remember, Cuba has been an official terrorist state for 40 years, still is. Uh, so let's have a look at, how, at Cuba's record as a terrorist state. Well, here's what happened. Uh, but the Batista dictatorship, which the US had backed, was overthrown in January 1959. That's when Castro took over. Two months later, in March, a lot of materials come out from the declassified record on this. In March, two months later, the U.S. National Security Council began to consider means to institute what's now called regime change, that is, overthrow the government, two months. In May, uh, two months later, the CIA began to arm anti-Castro guerrillas inside Cuba. Uh, flights over Cuba by planes based in Florida, 
uh, they began a couple of months later in October. In July 1960, Cuba called on the United Nations for help. It provided the Security Council with detailed records of a couple of dozen bombings, including names of pilots, uh, plane registration numbers, uh, unexploded bombs they'd found, and so on, and it alleged uh, considerable damage and casualties. The U.S. ambassador responded by giving what he called his assurance that the United States has no aggressive purpose against Cuba. Uh, four months before that, as he certainly knew, a formal decision had been made in secret to overthrow the government, and preparations for the Bay of Pigs invasion were well advanced. Uh, notice that lying is not a new invention designed for Iraq. It's worth keeping in mind. Well, this March 1960 decision uh, for regime change uh, called for overthrow of Castro in favor of a regime, I'm quoting, more devoted to the true interests of the Cuban people and more acceptable to the United States. Uh, those two notions are taken to be synonymous. Uh, intelligence at that point reported that support for Castro was high, people were optimistic, but the United States would determine the true interests of the Cuban people. Uh, the plans also keep, called for keeping the U.S. role in regime change secret uh, out of concern for the effect elsewhere, particularly in Latin America. Shortly after came the Bay of Pigs invasion. It was beaten back. Uh, John F. Kennedy ordered his staff to unleash the terrors of the earth against Cuba because of its successful defiance of the United States. Uh, these are mostly quotes. Uh, this was not just resistance to invasion. Uh, Kennedy planners warned of the impact the very existence of Castro's regime has upon leftist movements in many Latin American countries. Its very existence represents a successful defiance of the United States, a negation of our whole hemispheric policy of almost a century and a half. Uh, based on the principle of subordination to the U.S. will, uh, history's purpose, as scholars tell us. Uh, the basic problem was, still reading the internal record, Cuba was providing an example and general stimulus that might encourage agitation and radical change in other parts of Latin America where social and economic conditions invite opposition to ruling authority and susceptibility to the Castro idea of taking matters into one's own hands. And those are grave dangers when the distribution of land and other forms of national wealth greatly favors the propertied classes and the poor and underprivileged, stimulated by the example of the Cuban Revolution, are now demanding opportunities for a decent living. Well, as if that wasn't bad enough, uh, there was also the successful resistance to a U.S. invasion, which is an intolerable threat to what's called credibility, and that warranted the terrors of the earth and destructive economic warfare to excise the cancer. Actually, there was a public doctrine also announced, announced by Dean Acheson, a senior statesman and top Kennedy advisor. Uh, in 1962, he informed the uh, American Society of International Law that uh, no legal challenge arises in the case of a, no legal issue arises in the case of a U.S. response to any challenge to its power, prestige, uh, its power, position, or prestige, okay? So if there's a U.S. response, say, who knows what, nuclear war, to a challenge to U.S. power, position, and prestige, that's not a legal issue. It's nothing that concerns the U.N. or World Court or anyone else. Uh, that doctrine from the extreme liberal wing of the spectrum uh, appears to go beyond even the recent Bush doctrine just announced, uh, so-called, which grants Washington the right to uh, resort to violence against any perceived threat anywhere in the world perhaps an illustration of the uh, breadth of the political spectrum in elite circles. Well, in the Kennedy planning 
uh, documents, Russia is indeed mentioned. Uh, it's mentioned as hovering in the background, offering development loans, uh, presenting itself as a model for development in a single generation. Actually, that's a large part of the reason for the Cold War ever since 1917. Interesting topic, also well documented. Uh, going back to terrorism, in November 1961, it's under Kennedy, a special secret group was established to carry out anti-Cuba terrorism, that's Operation Mongoose, run from a CIA station in Miami. Uh, the Cubans and the Russians uh, took Kennedy's terrorist attacks to be preliminary to invasion. The Secretary of Defense McNamara has recently agreed that this was a plausible judgment from their point of view, he said he would have reached it himself in their shoes, though he claims it wasn't planned. Uh, he also pointed out that if there had been an invasion, that would have led with 99% probability to nuclear war. In February 1962, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, we've just learned, uh, approved a plan to concoct a pretext that would allow the United States to invade and destroy Castro with speed, force, and determination, quoting secret document. Uh, in the weeks right before the missile crisis, a terrorist group based in Florida uh, approved a plan to con uh, uh, carry it out, in fact, um, attacks, speedboat strafing, strafing attacks on a seaside hotel in Cuba, right near Havana, uh, killing 20 Russians and Cubans. Uh, shortly after, they attacked British and uh, Cuban cargo ships and again raided Cuba against, along with a lot of other terrorist actions that were stepped up in early October, uh, while Congress passed a resolution which, quoting it, sanctioned the use of force, if necessary, to restrain Cuban aggression and subversion in the Western Hemisphere and voted to withhold aid from any country trading with this terrorist state. Uh, at one of the tensest moments of the missile crisis, a terrorist team dispatched from Washington uh, blew up a Cuban industrial facility, killing 400 workers, according to Cuban sources, that are taken quite seriously by senior U.S. analysts. I leave it to your imagination to say what would have, guess what would have happened if that had been reversed. Uh, that continued after the missile crisis ended. Uh, ten days before his assassination, uh, Kennedy authorized new and more extreme terrorist attacks. And it continued later, peaked in the late 70s. Again, pretty serious. Uh, included poisoning crops and livestock, contaminating sugar exports, blowing up a civilian aircraft, killing 73 people, and plenty more. In fact, it was still going on in the 90s, still based in Florida where the perpetrators are protected from punishment or extradition, not to speak of Washington itself. If you read George Bush's recent uh, national security strategy document, you'll recall that uh, one of the injunctions is that we now treat uh, terrorism as equivalent to genocide, the most serious of crimes, and that any state that is involved in any way in this crime uh, must be destroyed, its leadership either punished or killed. Uh, commentators were kind enough uh, not to point out that George Bush ought to quickly be sent to Guantanamo uh, for inciting... Uh, uh, commentators, in fact, passed that over uh, quietly. Notice that we're now sampling the liberal extreme of the political spectrum. Uh, Cuba's crimes became even more immense uh, in the mid-70s when it uh, served as the instrument of Russia's crusade to dominate the world, so Washington announced. 1975, uh, UN Ambassador Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who ranks very high in the liberal pantheon, he thundered that if Soviet neocolonialism succeeds in Angola, the world will not be the same in the aftermath. Europe's oil routes will be under Soviet control, as will the strategic South Atlantic, with the next target on the Kremlin's list being Brazil. Sounds kind of familiar. Uh, 
Uh, Washington's fury in this case was caused by another Cuban act of successful defiance. Uh, a US-backed South African invasion right then was close to conquering a newly independent Angola in 1975. Uh, Cuba sent troops to the government on its own initiative, scarcely even notifying the Russians, and they beat back the invaders, another act of successful defiance. Uh, this one had large-scale effects. The South African press warned of the boost to African nationalism, which has seen South Africa forced to retreat, and US officials agreed. They concluded that the defeat of Washington's South African ally had blurred the image of South African and white mercenary invincibility and stimulated all the wrong feelings among those people. Uh, all of that is now very well established in the most respected scholarship. Uh, Washington and South Africa didn't take it lightly. Atrocities by Washington and South African ally uh, and its favorite terrorist commander, Jonas Savimbi, practically destroyed Angola in the Reagan years, you know, reversing gains of the early independence period. I've already mentioned that. Uh, well, this 40-year campaign to unleash the terrors of the earth against Cuba qualifies uncontroversially as international terrorism and of a scale and character that doesn't have many counterparts. Uh, thousands of people were killed, terrible effect on the society and the economy, but it doesn't count for the usual reasons. It does not constitute international terrorism. Uh, it was compounded by economic warfare of unprecedented severity. Uh, that became even harsher, as I'm sure you know, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, which eliminated the Soviet pretext, which was fraudulent, as we know from internal documents. And it's quite interesting to see how the US doctrinal system didn't miss a beat as the pretext switched. Actually, that happened in quite interesting ways across the board at the time. Uh, since Clinton, the U.S. embargo effectively bans even food and medicine. Uh, the health consequences are severe. Uh, they were reviewed in some detail by an extensive study of the American Association for World Health a couple of years ago, which concluded that only Cuba's remarkable health care system had prevented what they called humanitarian catastrophe, received virtually no mention in the United States. Uh, US Economic warfare has been bitterly condemned in every relevant international forum. It was even declared illegal by the Judicial Commission of the uh, normally compliant Organization of American States. Uh, the European Union called on the World Trade Organization to condemn the embargo. And the Clinton administration had an official response, namely as follows. Uh, Europe is challenging three decades of American-Cuba policy that goes back to the Kennedy administration and is aimed entirely at forcing a change of government in Havana, what's now called regime change, supposedly an innovation. Uh, the US uh, withdrew from the World Trade Organization proceedings, rendering the issue moot. Well, these uh, 40 years of international terrorism and economic warfare to impose regime change, still continuing, are well known but they're considered quite legitimate in elite sectors, so obviously legitimate that they're never even brought up in the debates about the uh, allegedly novel Bush doctrine of bringing about regime change as Washington chooses. Now, that's the usual practice with regard to one's own crimes, and uh, we rightly deplore it uh, when it takes place in totalitarian states where at least apologists can plead fear and extenuation. Well, there are plenty more examples. You can go on if you want, but let me stop with that. It's an illustrative one. Cuba is probably the target of more international terrorism than maybe most of the rest of the world combined in the last 40 years, but didn't count any more than the peak examples of 1985 in the Middle East or what happened in the, anything that happened in the first phase of the war on terror that was redeclared by the same people with the same rhetoric on September 11th. Well, plenty more to say about this, but reviewing the record, I think it's not unreasonable to conclude that the crimes of September 11th, which were certainly real, uh, offered opportunities 
to extend plans that were already in place. Uh, the Bush doctrine of preemption is an illustration. Plenty of antecedents going back to Atchison's declaration in 1962 and the acts that went along with it, in fact, many before that. Uh, the new one is novel in its brazen formulation, but it's otherwise pretty familiar. And the same is true of the plans for uh, unilateral world domination through absolute military superiority, uh, which make the United States a menace to itself and the world under this administration's leadership. Actually, I'm quoting from uh, a senior associate of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, Anatole Yevin, uh, highly respected commentator who is reflecting the opinion of a good bit of the world, maybe almost all of it. Uh, it was predicted at once uh, that the September 11th uh, atrocities would be a catastrophe for the Palestinians and indeed for other suffering and oppressed people, and that proved to be true. Uh, governments all over the place uh, seized on September 11th as a kind of window of opportunity to escalate uh, harsh and repressive programs all, already underway. Uh, the Russians in Chechnya, China and Western China, Indonesia and Aceh, uh, Israel and the occupied territories and others, assuming that they could now continue and in fact escalate the atrocities with the approval of uh, the boss in Washington uh, under the pretext of war on terror. Uh, governments also used the opportunity to try to discipline their own populations, uh, including here, meaning to carry out, uh, carry forward uh, unpopular programs uh, under the guise of combating terrorism, uh, demanding what's called patriotism. Uh, patriotism means you shut up uh, and I'll pursue my own agenda relentlessly. Uh, and that happened. Uh, That was, that was instant, and it was pointed out right in the mainstream. So uh, Paul Krugman, this outstanding economist who's incidentally writing really remarkable regular columns in the New York Times, uh, pointed out right away that 48 hours after the terrorist attacks, uh, right-wing Republicans tried to ram through a sharp cut in the capital gains tax, 80% uh, of the benefits would go to 2% of taxpayers, uh, signaling, in his words, that they were determined to use terrorism as an excuse to pursue a radical right-wing agenda. Uh, he and others, plenty of others, have been documenting their successes ever since. Uh, these are recycled Reaganites, remember. And they did right away the same thing they did when the Reagan administration came in. They quickly drove the country into deep deficit so that Alan Greenspan can appear and soberly explain that we have to have fiscal discipline. Uh, that means uh, huge benefits for the rich by regressive fiscal measures and crumbs at best for everyone else. Uh, in general, the assault against the general population in the interests of quite narrow sectors of power uh, continues. These are the sectors that the Reagan Bush uh, political managers serve uh, with even more than the usual dedication. I believe there are a few examples familiar in Houston. Uh, well, there's only one way to get rid of, uh, to carry out such programs, to get away with them. Only one way has ever been known, that is terrify the population. I remember that the last cowboy in office was wailing about how uh, the Sandinistas are only two days marching time from Texas, and uh, Gaddafi was going to expel America from the world, and so on, uh, and it kind of worked. And the same familiar story is being relived in current propaganda. If you were a Bush campaign manager, and you're thinking about the coming, the, either this election or more crucially, the 2004 presidential election, the last thing you want is for people to be asking questions about uh, how they're gonna take care of their elderly mother or where my pension is or why medical costs are out of sight. Uh, 
or about the destruction of an environment in which maybe my grandchildren might survive, or the takeover of public goods by unaccountable private tyrannies, shrinking narrowly what's left of democracy, or the construction of new weapon systems that uh, uh, pose a real threat to human survival. It's not an exaggeration. That's all the wrong things for them to be looking at, plenty more. Rather, what they're supposed to be doing is chanting praises to the grand leader who miraculously saved them from a awesome danger and by then will be marching on to some new triumph. That's an old story, not just in the United States, of course. The German Minister of Justice was recently fired uh, because she dared to make some true and elementary comments about this but they remain true and elementary. Well, let me return finally to the same choices that we have always had. Uh, one choice is to worship our leaders and to paint uh, gratifying pictures of the wondrous future that lies ahead under our benign guidance, uh, realizing the uh, uh, history's uh, directions. Uh, a second choice is to take the rich historical and current record seriously, to draw reasonable conclusions, and to make use of the uh, ample opportunities that we are lucky enough to enjoy to change the course on which we're being led. 